Major funding for this program provided by PSE&G, committed to serving customers, strengthening communities, and investing in New Jersey's future. It's a cold, damp morning in late March, and a crew of biologists sets out to build an osprey nesting tower near Cape May. Ospreys need a raised structure to build their nests, and biologists Kathy Clark and Eric Stiles hustle to get another nesting tower up before the birds return. Together with Chief Biologist Larry Niles, they are the field work crew for the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program of the Division of Fish, Game, and Wildlife within New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. With the spring approaching, the group will have to prepare for the nesting seasons of the peregrine falcon and the bald eagle as well. Once nesting begins for all three species, there's about a three-month window when the crew can race from nest to nest around the state, collecting data on the young of these three species before they fledge. Yeah, this is a really nice design, isn't it? It's got a place for the ospreys to perch when they come into the nest, nice and high, and just a single pole so that predators can't get up it very easily. Protecting species has always been the mission of the program, and protection begins with habitat. But biologists no longer look at habitat as just a space, a site where one builds a nest, goes away, and hopes for the best. In a densely populated state like New Jersey, numerous factors have an impact on habitat, and species protection becomes even more complex. This is the story of biologists joining with the community to protect three species that were once near extinction. The osprey, whose number fell from 500 nests to only 50 nests by 1974. The peregrine falcon, which disappeared from the northeast completely by 1965. And the bald eagle, which dropped from 22 nests to a single nest in 1973. All three species have returned and their success stories mark a turnaround, the beginning of a new era. But can these species survive? This is the challenge of the new day. If there were a national experiment to study the modern challenges of conservation, there could be no better test case than New Jersey. With over 1,000 people per square mile in the third smallest state, New Jersey remains the most densely populated state in the nation. And development continues steadily. There is no date when one can say people's attitudes toward wildlife suddenly changed. But management began formally in 1973 when New Jersey's Division of Fish, Game, and Wildlife established the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program. A pivotal player in the creation of the program was biologist Paul Pete McLean. People frequently ask, what makes an endangered species? What causes a species to pass out of existence? Usually it's something man or nature does to the environment. A perfect example would be this osprey nesting on this old cedar tree out on the tidal marsh. As the beach was developed, the houses took over, the trees were cut down, and the ospreys had no place to live. Development also increased the problem of human disturbance to nesting birds. The use of DDT adversely affected egg development and combined with other factors to decimate the osprey, the peregrine falcon, and eagle populations. Their low numbers indicated not only a wildlife tragedy, but an environmental crisis. The Endangered and On-Game Species Program has responded in a variety of ways, building nests with towers with the help of volunteers, introducing young birds by raising them in New Jersey nests, and monitoring the three populations as they gradually returned. Over two decades of management has produced a wildlife success story, but the recovery has only just begun. 
and the mission of the program, protecting these species, continues. It's early May, and a team of biologists and volunteers begins the banding season at a nest on the Cohansee River. The program keeps an accurate record of eagle production and survival, and that's best done by banding chicks before they're large enough to fly away. The eagle chicks are quickly taken from the nest to be examined one chick at a time. They're hooded for their own protection, and their talons, already dangerously sharp, are wrapped for the protection of the handlers. Then the chick is banded so that the data collected can be used when and if this particular bird is spotted in the future. This green band is uh, to signify New Jersey. Encounters of banded eagles provide information on their migration, survival, lifespan, and nesting habitats. Banding is done only once in the bird's life, and the team makes the most of it. Yeah. Dr. Erica Miller from the Tri-State Bird Rescue in Delaware assists in the examination, and volunteer nest monitor Augie Sexauer, who watches the nest throughout the year, gets a rare chance to actually hold a bald eagle. Yeah. If all of our nests that we're looking at right now are going to be productive and have two, then we might have 21 chicks. 21 chicks, wow. That's great. I never oh, thought I'd live to see it, because I can remember... Uh, Oh, back in the early 1950s, we were, Ed Manners and I were looking at the last, what we thought was the last eagle nest in New Jersey. I didn't think that uh, we would ever see anything like this with, uh, what, 11 nests this year? Uh, so far, 10 successful, possibly. Yeah, that's great. Maintaining the eagle population focuses on minimizing human disturbance, and each nest brings its own individual challenges. At Union Lake in Millville, biologists actually resituated a nest to improve the bird's original choice. This nest is a real important uh, uh, nest for us in uh, several ways. Uh, the first is that when the birds first located here, uh, they built out on an island out in the lake that was very vulnerable to disturbance. And it really points to the problem for eagles, is that when they're setting up new nests, they don't know that they're going to be disturbed when they're building the nest because they're building it in winter. But as soon as the ice starts thawing and, and people start using the water, then it was a bad spot to nest. Uh, so biologists decided to try and locate them to a safer haven here on the mainland. What they did was uh, start the basic frame for a nest and get stick material and give a jump start to the bald eagles. And they took to it right away. And it's quite a success story. Last year they raised and fledged two young, and this year we have three, which is quite a rarity. Now what's important about eagles' nest, what we found because we've built several nests successfully, is that the birds are looking for trees that are high above the canopy so that when the young start coming off the nest, they need a nice, easy platform to learn how to fly from. I got up there, there were three birds. Uh, one bird had a lure in its chest. The uh, chief thing that is important about this is not that there was a lure there, but that we got to it and we were able to get it out. The bird with the fish hook had two of the prongs caught into its breast muscle. So what I had to do was push the prongs through the skin. And we cleaned out the wound, um, put on some topical antibiotic, and then injected the bird with some antibiotic. Each nest, each chick is critical. Hey, Bob, you know where Collins Pond is? All right, why don't we check that one first? Monitoring ospreys is done a little differently. Unlike eagles, ospreys hatch in much greater numbers, and fears of falling back toward extinction are less than the anxiety that the population is growing too large to count. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Biologists take to the air and collect data on active nests in the bountiful marshes along the Atlantic coast. The high numbers of ospreys have forced the issue, but biologists don't seem to mind. It means the environment is healthy enough to sustain growing numbers. Here at Island Beach, there are about 22 nesting platforms that were built in 1974. Uh, these uh, platforms are where these birds have nested, 
1995, every single platform was used by Ospreys, and well over 50 Ospreys were banded here at Island Beach. This could conceivably be, and probably is, the largest concentration of Ospreys on the East Coast per unit area. This is one of the low nests we Volunteers, have. led by Pete McLean, still monitor young Ospreys around Island Beach to support the program's biannual count. We get out here three or four times a year and visit the nest. We like to visit them early in the season to determine how many birds we have back. And then we like to know how many birds nest. And then we like to know what they produce in the way of young. And then finally, we like to ban them. Today, we're out here seeing what we're producing. Uh, we try to get to every single nest that we have in this particular area, which is about 20. Only licensed biologists and volunteers can legally approach osprey towers. In fact, any tampering with the nests of any protected species by unlicensed people, however well-intentioned, is against federal law. These are primarily young birds that we have here, and uh, it's really good to know what's going on because from the aerial surveys, uh, we're able to give some idea what the production is out here uh, when they just go over a nest very fast and don't really see how many birds are in it. So it's really important to do this research to find out how we're progressing. Closer to the Delaware Bay near Salem, ospreys are less secure. Biologists banned those birds now returning here, an area they once inhabited in larger numbers. Kathy Clark joins employees of the local power company to ban chicks nesting on their transmission towers. Um, what's unique about um, the, the transmission towers and the nesting ospreys in this area is uh, there are no unique structures for ospreys to use, uh, such as platforms or dead trees, which is their usual nesting areas or nesting sites. They choose our transmission towers. Uh, the centers of the towers provide a unique and very uh, worthwhile nest site. They're high, they're 50, 55 feet high, uh, which gives them a, a great view of the area, and it also provides protection. PSENG has been monitoring the ospreys uh, on our transmission towers for approximately 20 years. It's not far away from flying. Public Service Electric and Gas has also assisted program biologists with their study of contaminants and the low local productivity. Um, yeah, let me get a towel, all right? This banding at Salem is, I think, especially important because the productivity has been so low that we really need to know what's going on with the birds that fledge here, if they're coming back, if they're not, if they're showing up someplace else. And there's not that many birds fledging here, so it's really worth the effort. Nesting peregrine falcons look for two basic conditions, protection from predators, including human disturbance, and an available, healthy food supply of small birds. Forsyth Wildlife Refuge is a federally protected strip of wild beach and back bays on New Jersey's southern coast. It was a perfect choice for building a peregrine nesting tower. Monitoring the peregrine falcon more closely resembles the monitoring of eagles than osprey. Biologists visit all 15 nest sites, first to check for young, then to ban them. He's next. Well, there's two chicks in here um, and one unhatched egg. And they had laid three eggs, right, Tracy? They laid three eggs on the 22nd when I came up. There were three eggs. And what we have here is just two chicks, which is okay. And uh, one of them's female, one of them's male, because that female's a lot bigger. And then we'll take this egg when we're done and, uh, and take that to the lab. Okay, I'm gonna need the uh, right leg first. Finally starting to turn out like peregrines, huh? She's on the white fuzz. She's ball. a little bit. A little As bit with farther. eagles, a banded peregrine Big. spotted later in life can tell biologists about movement patterns and the health of the population. 
peregrines have begun moving to some unlikely nests. Nesting pairs have been found on the ledge of an Atlantic City casino. And even on bridges, there's a nest tucked underneath a girder on the George Washington Bridge, near the same Palisades cliffs the peregrines inhabited over 40 years ago. The city of Kearney sits in the middle of the urban crunch just above Newark and across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Peregrine adults have chosen the Hackensack River as their feeding ground and a high ledge on a power plant along the river as their nest. The peregrines nesting on this building are probably a little more susceptible to uh, urban problems like contaminated prey. There's a lot more contaminants in the rivers in this area, so we would expect that their prey that they're taking locally do have more contaminants. They also face greater problems with dealing with people and within urban areas. Well, at this age, they'll be a little Plant employees were pleasantly surprised. They, actually, they, use, your, they use their feet. I've been working at PSCNG at this Carney site for about 15 years. We've been noticing well, these peregrine balconies able, in the area, and uh, just recently we found that they were nesting on the side of this building. When individuals at the power company learned that the peregrines were once endangered, they immediately offered their support to program biologists. The company has become pretty much a bunch of peregrine watchers. People would come outside at lunchtime and pepper me with peregrine questions and uh, feel the birds were really safe out here. You know, the guys were very protective of them. It's sort of an ideal piece of real estate for a peregrine. They have the height, they're pretty free of human encroachment. They have a clear view. There's abundant prey. There are a lot of pigeons and starlings. You know, if I were a peregrine, I'd probably want to live here, too. I think the long-term chances for this nest of peregrines are pretty good. This is an area we can work with a landowner to manage the site properly. And uh, we can even work around, you know, work schedules or whatever. and make room for the peregrines just enough so that they can uh, stay here and continue to nest. This is the kind of cooperation the biologists look for and cultivate. The efforts of the power company belie the mythic image of corporations pitted against wildlife biologists. The same power company, PSE&G, has begun working with biologists to protect southern coastal wetlands because it is crucial habitat for the entire Delaware estuary. They've initiated an ambitious estuary enhancement program where land along the bay will be returned to its natural state and then preserved forever in an effort to help aquatic and bird species alike. Corporations support the program's work in many ways. A new peregrine tower is going up in Ocean Gate, a small peninsula extending into Barnegat Bay. It replaces an old tower situated on the secluded grounds of a telecommunications company antenna farm. This is the first time we've replaced a tower in about 12 years. It's part of the maintenance of this population. So in order to maintain peregrines in New Jersey, we're going to need to maintain their nesting areas too. What's also really important to us in the Endangered Species Program is that we have really great partnerships. JCPNL did a lot of the work. They uh, really built the tower for us. Uh, AT&T is providing a lot of materials, a lot of help. So we really have these great partnerships uh, with both corporations and individuals that help us get this work done. Individuals have historically participated in the restoration of these bird populations in many ways. And this tradition continues. Well, we actually have two goals in mind. One is education, to try and educate the public about the environment and wildlife. But the main purpose is really to take in injured wild birds, try and resolve whatever is wrong with them, and set them free back into the wild. Don Bonica operates Tom's River Avian Care. We average yearly about 2,000 birds a year. And totally, we've treated, we feel, somewhere between 15 and 16,000 birds. We work with the Endangered Species Program very, very closely, actually. Um, over this past year, we've had bald eagles, peregrine falcons, piping plovers, black skimmers, and they are all endangered species in the state of New Jersey. We've had all of them come in for rehab. 
and we enjoy it. We do it very, very well, and we enjoy it. There's nothing greater joy than to have a young child come here that has an injured bird, and to someday later give it back to them and say, here, son, you let the bird go free. Okay, Peter, you can hold him. And uh, now when you slide down that leg, don't let him get you. You can just slide your hand right down over those talons. Volunteerism is a two-way street. Nervous. Let me just get a hold of this. Ah! Behave yourself. <laughs> Biologists get a hand in completing the data collection, and volunteers get a rare opportunity to see and actually work with the species. Biologists working with volunteers help to build public awareness as well as share their inspiration. Juvenile, Osprey, and what we're going to do, we're going to close this temporarily. Building public awareness is critical because protection of a species often depends on the support of a local community. The Morris River feeds into the Delaware Bay, and along its banks, there are community members who have organized their own osprey network. When we first started, there's maybe two or three platforms on the river. We've put up about 22 platforms. Right now, about 14 are active. I have a couple of inactive ones, and we don't have a cumulative total of 22 because we move them around. With ospreys, everything's location, location, location. Three about seven and a half week old chicks. We usually like to get them at five or six weeks. So these were a little older and uh, they were a little bit more independent minded than the young ones. It, what they do is they lay down and they uh, play dead or like possum. And then as soon as we moved uh, one of the birds, he stayed in that same uh, position of just sort of playing dead. But the other two came very much alive and uh, we were trying to avoid being bitten and also avoid having them jump out and get hurt. Now, 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 don't get your brothers all upset. Stay in the net. Our group's name is Citizens United to protect the Morris River and its tributaries. And sometimes we're, you know, objecting to different development projects or that sort of thing. But it's not the thrust of what we do. And in this project, you really get to see real results and all of it's because of the number of people that just take time to make it happen. The decisions that planning and zoning boards make today is a commitment to future generations. Right now, those things that aren't selected for protection will ultimately be developed. And so it's so important that we make a commitment to the open spaces that are left in New Jersey so that the legacy that we leave for our youth is something that can be cherished and something that we can be proud of. Not everyone in the community needs to be involved in a hands-on way. But general support, such as voting on preservation issues or supporting zoning laws, goes a long way. Eagles are extremely sensitive to contaminants, and consequently they serve as a good barometer of the quality of a local environment. If you have an eagle in your area, you can be reasonably sure you have a safe place to live. Kenny Trollander is the, the owner, farmer, uh, was real, uh, really liked the idea that the birds were here. So we worked with him because now we got a, a landowner who really cares about the eagles, wants to protect them, wants the same thing we want, which is to keep people from coming in here and disturbing it. At the same time, he had no impact on his farming, so. Um, we could say to people, we're not trying to change the way that you do things. We're just, all we want to do is protect this nest. At first, uh, they seemed to be a little nervous, but then as time went on, they seemed to get used to the equipment and the certain vehicles that we had, and, and now it's to the point where it doesn't bother them at all, actually. This nest is the only nest that we've had three chicks. Uh, fledge in the last four years out of the last six years that this pair has been nesting. It's the only nest in New Jersey where we have had three chicks. It's probably an indication that there's a good food supply around here. It's also probably an indication that there is individual variability. This is a pair that very often has had three. During banding, the team collects data on the chick's physical condition. Blood samples taken will alert biologists to any potential contamination in the system. As long as you're holding it secure. <laughs> With each chick, um, since we've got them in the hand, we're going to put leg bands on them for identification. We use this chance to also take some measurements. We'll find out the age and sex of each chick. 
and we take a blood sample for contaminant analysis. Mainly we're going to be looking for uh, typical kind of things that they'll run into like organochlorine pesticides and, and heavy metals. And at this point it's kind of routine. The other good thing is that out on the road there, you can see all those cars, that people can watch this nest without disturbing it, because in between is a marsh. And they can't get across the marsh to the nest, and the birds know that. The success of these species is both the mission and the inspiration for the biologists, and current numbers are a testament to years of work. Osprey pairs have surpassed 200. Peregrine falcons have reached 15 pairs, and bald eagles have returned from a single pair to 11. But the people who work directly with these species also take heart in the widespread support of citizens who help in numerous ways. It's rewarding and a great sense of personal satisfaction to be involved in a program where something positive is done for wildlife and our environment. It's also gratifying to experience the wholehearted support of the general public and New Jersey industry in encouraging and supporting New Jersey's endangered wildlife restoration program. There is no way these species could have come back without the support of the community Landowners, volunteers, and companies are all essential to maintaining endangered species within our communities. These species, in turn, enrich those communities of which they are a part. If I'm asked to justify our work, the practical side of me says these species are our canaries in the cage. If they fail, then we're going to be next. But we do this for another reason. We see eagles soaring or peregrines stooping on prey or ospreys feeding their young. We know that just as we pass on our material wealth to our children, we must pass on this natural wealth. Because of these recoveries, New Jersey has benefited greatly as well. The widespread support has paid off for these three species, and the success of each species signifies both an improvement in the environment and a higher quality of life for the people of the Garden State. Major funding for this program provided by PSE&G, committed to serving customers, strengthening communities, and investing in New Jersey's future.